because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Coaches, no introduction needed for our guest on the Basketball Podcast this week, uh, Fran Frischella. Uh, Coach, amazing to have you here. And just quickly, for those that may not be aware, ESPN College Basketball Analyst, International Hoops Junkie. Well, let's just say Hoops Junkie. And then yep. former head coach at Manhattan, St. John's in New Mexico. But coach, thanks for taking the time and sharing the game with us. Oh, Chris, it's such a pleasure. I can't even tell you how many times. I think I've listened to almost every podcast. You get me through hour, hour and 15 minute workouts every week. And you've had some incredible guests. I've learned so much. And to be a part of this and share the game today with you is really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And Coach, I mean, I got to think that you at this point are one of the top experts in the world, having both coached the game at multiple levels, but also attended so many practices. And that's one of the hidden values of your job, right? Is you get to go watch these programs intimately. Is that still something that excites you? Every single day, Chris. You and I were talking a little bit earlier. I have been around this game for 50 years, really. I'm, you know, since I was about 10 years old growing up in New York City. And of course, that's the you know, one of the meccas, I guess, of of this great game of basketball. And I have always enjoyed the process of learning the game. And it's never ending. It sometimes bothers me when I see a really cool idea or a really cool drill or a cool inbounds play. And I say to myself, man, I wish I'd have known about that when I was coaching. So uh, what I try to do now is be a conduit for other coaches and pass around the stuff that I see whether it's at a practice or at a clinic or talking to a coach. I love being a resource at this stage of my career and uh, really enjoy helping coaches as much as anything now. Well, and, and you've done so much helping. I mean, just just the open sharing and, and, and the different things. And I guess that's what it leads back to me. Like if, if you're getting prepared, let's say, we'll talk about your off season in a second, but let's say yeah. you're preparing to do game, you know, yeah. Michigan versus Kansas. When you get to go, prepare for this game? Are you getting to see practice? Are you getting to see shoot arounds? What are you everything. exposed to? Yeah, everything, everything. I know in advance, you know, oftentimes a month or more, like what my schedule is. And so I am always attuned to what the teams are doing. One of the reasons, Chris, I love my job so much as a broadcaster now is I know other coaches listen. And many of these guys are still very close friends of mine. And I don't ever want to say anything on the air that some coach is who may, you know, who I may or may not know well, say, man, he didn't do his homework. And so I I take a lot of pride in the fact that I spend 365 days a year at this, you know, it's part of my DNA. And so, yes, I'll watch film of teams. I will go to practices before I do the game. And quite frankly, one of the things I enjoy most about my job is, I can predict how a game is going to flow. Now, I don't know who's going to win, but based on my, you know, my coaching experience, you've done this so many times as you get ready for your opponents, I kind of feel like I'm preparing for two opponents, and I also know what each team is going to try to do strategically to the other, and I try to predict that in advance and, and, and explain that to the viewer at home. So I still get to be a coach but I don't have to carry the wins and losses out of that arena uh, with me. Well, I think about the people I like to hear comment on a game are people like you that can balance that coaching side with the entertainment side. I got to think this is a little bit of a political challenge for you too, because you can't share too much, right? You can't share some of the intimacy (laughs) of of exactly what you see. (laughs) Well, I've done so many Kansas games that Bill Self, you know, he hates it when I say, here comes the lob. (laughs) <laughs> you know, because you kind of, it's almost really like getting, you know, going back to my coaching days where you watch so much tape and that all of a sudden you see, a, I can see the misdirection in an offense and I go, oh, they're coming back to the post guy on the other side. You just have that innate feel that you've had as you've had as a coach, as you prepare for opponents. So I have to be a little careful about that, but it is fun when you kind of know what teams are trying to do to exploit each other. And I've always said this, and I've probably tweeted this out too. One of the things I enjoy about my job now is there's the game plan. Then there's the adjustment to the game plan made by the other coach. 
And then there's the adjustment to the adjustment. And very few coaches, I think, Chris, get to that adjustment to the adjustment. And I'm kind of always looking for that. Chris Beard is outstanding at that at Texas Tech, for example. They'll figure out what you're going to adjust to with their offense, and they'll have an adjustment to your adjustment. So as a former coach, I'm still factoring that into my, you know, my analysis. Well, and that's part of how the game's changed a lot, too, is that it used to be coaches had their system and they weren't going to change their system. And right. now you're seeing coaches more be more adaptable, to be more flexible, to be able to even you know, change within the game. Is, is that something that you're seeing a little bit more from the NCAA level? I am, but you also see coaches who are not in that, I guess we'd call it a growth mindset, right? You know, that they have a fixed way of playing and you know that this is what they're going to throw at you. And it's very interesting sometimes to watch a game realize a guy's a pretty good coach he's got you know 400 wins and he doesn't make the adjustment to the adjustment and one of the reasons I love watching international basketball in the NBA and I heard your great podcast with my good friend Jay Triano a couple weeks ago is just all of the decision making that goes on in a game of two really well coached teams because you have to be prepared you know you're I, I always felt this way about coaching my team If I don't give my team the answers to the test, whether it's – I can remember early in my career, we ran a lot more pick and roll than I think a lot of people ran back when I started coaching 20 years ago. But then, you know, what happens when you run great pick and roll? Well, well, you know, the adjustments, the blitzes, the hard hard hedges, you know, the ice – uh, you know, the ice and the down defenses. So one of the things I wish coaches would do a better job of is to provide solutions to their team for the type of things that are thrown at them. And I learned a lot from Steve Nash when I heard him talk about pick and roll offense, because he made a great point, Chris. I never, I'll never forget this. I use it all the time. He had to have a solution for every pick and roll coverage. And I love that word solution because I think, I think really that's what coaches are doing. They're solving a puzzle for their team to put them in a better position to be successful. Well, I love the word too, and I use it a lot. And, and it's because it's also a learner's language, yeah. right? Like learners are coming and trying to come up with solutions and even referring to players as learners is a part of that process. So yes. possibilities and solutions rather than musts and have tos. And huge part of it. And I think you've seen that a lot with some of the adaptability, as you refer to Chris Beard and some of these coaches that are coaching a more modern way and a more modern game, that that's happening more and more. Yeah. And I think particularly on the offensive end, I have to tell you, I've got two, two sons that are, you know, starting their coaching careers. And I've told them both that, you know, it's a lot easier to be a good defensive coach than it is a good offensive coach. And I don't know how you feel about this. I'd love your opinion. But if I can get five guys to play as hard as possible in some sort of four or five man shell defense every single day in practice, no matter what your schemes are, we're going to be pretty good defensively. But offense requires so much more thought process as far as spacing, timing, making the extra pass putting your best offensive players in position where they can be most successful on the court. And that's why I admire watching, you know, really good offensive coaches like down here, you know, down in the States, obviously, I think of Bob McKillop, Rick Bird, who's just retired from Belmont, Lenny Acuff, who's a great coach, who's now going to take over at Lipscomb. And I know you can think of 10 others, guys that really understand offense and get their team to play almost in a, if I might say, a melodic musical way. You know, there's great flow, there's great music being made through their offensive, you know, execution. Well, and that, this may be a difficult thing to say or a difficult thing to hear for people, but I couldn't agree more from the defensive side. And I think defense, if anything, is overrated by coaches in the sense that not that it's valuable, not important, but that we spend way too much time on defense and certainly perfecting technique in ways that probably don't matter and don't transfer to the game. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and I think as it relates to practice, which I know is a topic we'll talk about, you know, I always felt that we wanted to emphasize defense but practice offense. Like, I always felt that a good breakdown for our practice, whether it was a two-hour practice or a shorter practice during the year, was, hey, we're going to spend about 33% of our time on that practice on our defense. We're going to emphasize the heck out of it during those two hours, 
but we really have to work more on the offensive end to get where we want to go because it's never made I, I think one of the reasons we see so many guys that lean towards trying to become good defensive coaches, quite frankly, and it pains me to say this, and this is why guys like you and I are trying to share what we know, is it just takes more time and more thought process to be really good at the offensive end. And I've, I've counseled both of my sons to really study great offensive coaches as they start their careers. Well, we haven't seen it that much that the NBA spacing and the European spacing or FIBA game spacing, it hasn't come into the NCAA game quite yet at some of the highest levels. There's still spacing yeah. to the 45 instead of spacing the corners, different yeah. things like that. Do you think that's going to be a gradual change, or do you think the three-point line moving out will help that a little bit more? Too? Well, I think it has been coming. It absolutely has been coming. As someone like you that shares a love of international basketball, you know the analogy I always give, Chris, and we have to give credit to Dr. Naismith, the Canadian, in your honor, and by the way, who invented <laughs> awesome. the game. But I always tell my American friends, UB Brown and Jack Ramsey and Chuck Daly and Bob McKillop, you know, they took the game to places around the world and really taught the game of basketball. And here's my analogy. American coaches could walk into the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa from straight on, from dead on in front of it and say, this is a masterpiece. My European coaching friends are looking at the same masterpiece, but off to the side, you know, maybe a little different <laughs> angle than straight on. It's still a masterpiece, yeah. the game of basketball, but they see it, it differently. And those ideas are absolutely, and we've seen this over the last decade, spread, pick and roll, you know, ball movement, team, you know, team player and, and movement and cutting, uh, big guys who can space the floor. It, that's now permeating itself more and more, and not only at the NBA level, but certainly the college level. And that's really cool to see that the game has evolved over the last 50 years, thanks to guys like Jack Ramsey and Chuck Daly, and thanks to all my European coaching friends like David Platt and Sergio Scariola and all the other great coaches that have influenced us. It's just, again, you and I have seen it. There's great coaching all around the world. And, and again, the NCAA game... It's credit to them that the defensive side of the ball has been so far ahead of the offensive side. And now that yeah. part of it is now going to see, okay, which coach is going to adapt offensively to be able to get to that next level? Because it's yeah. a compliment to so many NCAA coaches. The defense is incredible. Like I watch those games sometimes and I go, how yeah. are we going to score? <laughs> I know. Well, especially when you, when you throw in, you know, especially at the higher levels of athletes that are at the high major level. But, you know, one of the beauties, I say this all the time. I mean this sincerely. Some of the, I would say five of the 10 best coaches I've ever been around in my life are coaches that the average fan has never heard of. It could be a great high school coach in Indiana. It could be one of my, you know, Canadian buddies, whether it was uh, Richie Spears way back in the day. I worked Richie Spears camp back in uh, the late seventies, uh, who, who was a tremendous Canadian coach for a while. Tremendous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I worked his camp in Montreal when I was a college sophomore. How about that? Eddie Pomacawa yeah. remains, <laughs> remains one of my close friends. But my whole point is like, one of the things I try to tell my coaching friends in the States and wherever I go around the world is that there are great coaches coaching at every level. You just don't know them because they're not on TV. And my yeah. job is to be able to explain to people what makes a great coach. And, you know, I know we're talking on the offensive end. And, man, I can just think of so many great coaches that I wish could coach in the Big Ten or the Big East. And people would see them for what they are, which is, you know, basketball savants. I uh, couldn't agree more. And I know we're going to circle back probably to offense and defense a little bit, but let's, yeah. let's focus a little bit on some of the expertise that I alluded to earlier, which is that you've watched so many practices and you've run so many practices. So right. let's talk about this first. Let's start with how do we make practices tougher than games? Because that is something yeah. like without struggle, there's no learning. We need to create struggle, but we need to create optimal struggle. So let's dive yeah. into that a little bit. Well, that was, the, that was probably the single biggest in my coaching philosophy, you know, and I, I say this, I didn't do a lot of things great, but the one thing I always, my players were like trained seals. And by that, I mean, they loved when high school, I, every practice of mine was open to coaches at any time. And especially in New York City, where there were so many great high school coaches in that metropolitan area. And I wanted people to come watch us practice because I wanted them to see how you could get a group of kids to play so hard with a purpose 
with every drill mattering, with every drill fitting into how you actually want to play. And we took real pride in that, Chris. And to the point where at the end of every season, we sat down as a coaching staff and went through the practice plans of the 110 or 120 practices we had and dissected what drills worked, what didn't work, what was the timing of drills and did we have too much offense at the beginning? Did we not have enough defense? What drills really correlated to how we played? And we threw drills out all the time and said, these are a waste. They don't fit the way we play. So we almost reverse engineered it, if that makes sense to you, that we would analyze what we were doing. But to get back to the point and something I believe in totally is the overload theory of anything that requires you know, uh, a high level of competency because it was not only physical overload, but mental overload. I wanted to create an environment and practice where there was constant thinking, decision making, which I know you're big on, and putting our guys in positions that would be both more physically and more taxing than the actual game itself so that the game could become easy. And it wouldn't be any different than training a pilot in a simulator. It wouldn't be any different than you know these young men that go to basic training to serve in the armed forces. You're going to make the training more difficult than what they might expect to see on a battlefield. Yeah, and I guess the part that comes back to me is that sometimes coaches, I guess because this has been you know, celebrated by coaches that you should be able to come to my practice and see the three things that we're doing every practice, right? That type of mindset. But I think one of the things that you should come to my practice and see is that my practice looks chaotic and it looks messy. And too many coaches want clean practices so they don't create these conditions you're talking about. Is that something you're seeing and observing too? Yeah. I I mean, I, I, listen, I get to see some of the best coaches in the country college during the season and attend a number of NBA practices, although they don't, you know, training camp is the best time, as you know, to really see what they're doing and what they're teaching. But absolutely, you know, I, there are days in practice where I want to stop and the guy might be a Hall of Famer. I want to run out there on the court and go, hey, I can make this drill better for you. You know, <laughs> I can I can make it a little bit more intense or a little bit more mentally taxing. So I absolutely think that's the case. Now, I'll say this because I know how important it is to you about the way you created decision-making in your practices. I do think, and you know, if, if I might just take you through a couple of things we did every day, I absolutely the first 20 minutes of every practice I ever coached, it was ball handling, passing, shooting, footwork, catching, and moving. We did that every day religiously to the point where I used to tell my team, don't get bored if you're getting better. Okay, I'm bored with the first 20 minutes also. Okay, I wanted them to know I was bored also. Like, I wanted to get on to the five on five stuff and the team stuff. But some of the things that were not negotiable to me were the 20, 25 minutes that we started every practice with to the point of I knew the kids were bored. So I would let them know it was okay to be bored because I would go to a guy, I'd say, Chris, when's the last time you traveled? Well, coach, I haven't traveled this year. Yeah, no fooling. That's why we do the Larry Brown footwork drill every day. Oh, yeah, now I get it. And the footwork was correlating to what we ran in, in terms of our offense, how we came off screens, what our, we choreographed that footwork. So there's a certain amount of rote and boredom that I think the kids have to understand is normal, as well as all of the decision-making drills that we did and all the five-on-five stuff. You said something really important there, and this is my thing. And again, it gets misconstrued a little bit what I say, but the main thing is you have to connect. I say coaching comes down to teaching, connecting, and transfer. And are you connecting those, what are their block drills or those on-air drills? Are you connecting them to what you're doing in five-on-five? And are they helping you win the game? And I like that you connected that back to your players in that example, but not enough coaches are doing that. They're not connecting why they're doing it. Yeah. And I can tell from listening to you um, on many occasions that uh, I would say five on five to you, you know, is probably not as important to the way you coach that chaos decision-making. But when we did our five on five uh, stuff, I had to explain to them the importance of the execution versus air. And the fact that in order to be a good offensive team, the more we ran our offense and had an imagination. See, I think this is something that coaches have to realize. 
You have, even when you are in that period of a practice where you're running through your offense five on O, oh, I wanted to make sure that the cut that there was no slippage. There, there was a uh, there was an element of execution and precision and imagination versus a defense, as opposed to just going through at seventy five percent speed with no thought to why we were running the things we were running. And so then when we brought it into a, a game like situation, we would explain to them why it was important to make every cut so precisely. So all of these things kind of added up to me as far as. That's why I say every single part of practice was critical to our success. And let's dive into drills because I know you talked about that and talking about them as being logical, habitual, and progressive. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. You know, let's just take the defensive end of the floor. You know, and we started every practice with what I would call no ball drills, something I learned from Ron Adams, the, the outstanding coach of the Golden State Warriors. When he was a successful assistant coach at, at Fresno State for a great coach by the name of Boyd Graham, they revolutionized, you know, pressure man-to-man defense on the West Coast, so much so that Jerry Tarkanian, his UNLV teams basically took the drills that Boyd Grant and Ron Adams developed. And one of the things I liked about building our defense from the ground up every day with no ball drills was we were focusing more on technique and intensity, although I know you, you saw in my notes where I, uh, Ron Adams has so often said, don't sacrifice technique for intensity, but they kind of fit together. And so we would do a, a series of, and only for five minutes of slides and denials and closeouts without a ball, because I didn't like the ball deflected out of bounds. And then we had to wait five seconds for the manager to go get it and throw it back in and then continue to drill. So that was kind of our, our build up to our, Next set of drills, which was one-on-one, two-on-two, four-on-four. And again, progression, you know, guarding the ball by yourself, then getting help from your teammate, and then getting help from three other teammates, and using foot fakes as a way to show help but not give help. And then, you know, logically from there would be all of our shell seats. And I had about 20 shell drills which we incorporated maybe four or five a day, Chris, not all of them, but we had certain shell drills we did every day. And then from shell drill, we would build up to the actual offenses we would see in a game. And we broke those down into what we call three-man series, three-man staggered double screens, three-man UCLA cut plays, three-man flex. And one of the things I like to do with my team was we would work on these things in the preseason even though we might not see a flex offense until mid-January. I didn't want to have to pull out the flex drills the day before a game. So again, building up from no ball to one-on-one to two-on-two to four-on-four, incorporating offensive schemes we'd see, rebounding drills, pick-and-roll coverages, and also incorporating that, the overload drills, uh, four-on-three contest. In other words, three put like a power play in hockey. Three players guarding four. We did a lot of those things. Switch and change. Coach Knight's old shell drill where we would switch and put the ball down in the half court and have to change from offense to defensive quickly and then switch and change at the full court. Again, getting them to not only physically react but mentally react. So that's how we kind of did it. That's what I mean by logical and progressive, building and building and building. Well, I know. just to add to that, the switch and change, the Bob Knight thing, is still, I would argue, one of the best things you can possibly do. And to add a load of challenge or desirable difficulty to your shell drill. Because too many people do shell drill at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, and the end of the year, exactly the same way. And what we know based on research is that doesn't develop learning. That develops comfort and confidence. So I love the switch and change concept. Yeah, and we had a series of those overload drills within our shell defense that we did create that kind of chaos and confusion that you talked about. But one of the things I used to really try to convince my team was the harder we go and the more precise we are, the shorter the drill is. So, you know, I would have people say, how do you get these guys to play so hard? And I would, I would simply explain that if we're not going to waste time, if the effort is great and the execution is great. So once we got to a point in the season where they knew You could be in this drill for 45 seconds or three minutes. It's basically on you as a player. 
and because we train them to be precise in our execution and in the level of intensity, they knew, let's get this done in 45 seconds and not mess around. And I would often come out in late February and show the kids the practice plan before practice and say, what's this say, Chris? And you'd say, coach, that says 45 minutes. And I would say, okay, I only want to be out here 45 minutes today. If you guys want to be out here an hour and a half, that's on you, not me. And again, you're creating that almost like, that's why I say I trained them like seals. You know, it's like we're throwing them fish in the water, you know, because they knew that if they accomplished the goal we set for them in the drill, we didn't have to waste a lot of time. We just moved on to the next thing. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's like, what's the goal of the drill? What's the purpose of it? Get it done. Move on. You've talked about non-negotiables. You kind of mentioned that already. So what are some of those little, little things you're fanatical about? Well, it was always, it was always things that I thought would eventually we come back to and say that got us beat. Anything from punctuality to uh, anything that involved, I'll give you a great example. Um, We did a drill every single day. I stole this from John Calipari, and I actually think I made it a little better, but don't tell him that. But (laughs) I did steal this idea of perfection from him, where we had three basic drills we started every practice with. And uh, it was some combination, Chris, of three-man weave and a full court. 42 left-handed layups in the full court as a team, and then 30 made short jumpers in the uh, back and forth in the full court. Kind of a three-line passing, and I didn't really care how far the jump shot was as long as it was outside the lane. And we charted the first five practice, five practices, and the managers would tell me, Coach, we made all three drills in seven minutes and 15 seconds on average. And so – the next practice, we would put, a, we'd put seven minutes on the clock and say, okay, perfection today, seven minutes, no more than two missed layups. And they knew that what the goal was. It was peer pressure, it was time pressure, the element of making uh, baskets pressure. And it was our way to – we didn't like to call the first part of our practice warm-up. We called it perfection. And so that was not negotiated. I would drop the time of perfection drill – from seven minutes to 6.50 to 6.45, and they would have to accomplish all three of those drills in that time period. And so that's what I mean by non-negotiable. We're getting this done with precision, with execution, with communication, with teamwork, with picking each other up, and we're going to do it in six minutes and 45 seconds today. That's the goal. And if you didn't make it, we put six minutes and 45 seconds again up on the clock, and we would do it again. And there were some practices during my career where we would do that drill five or six times before we started practice. And they would get the message. So this is the time of year, right? A lot of coaches are getting started or have just started. Yep. So what were some things that at the early in the year were things that you really valued and you thought were, hey, we've, we, this is so important in the beginning of the year. Let's stay away from obviously establishing culture and focus more on technical, tactical in terms of practice. But what were some things that are really important at the beginning of the year? Well, you know, I always, I always tell young coaches this, and I learned this. I learned a great lesson as a young head coach. And again, I'll mention John Calipari because he and I were very close friends. We met at Dean Smith's basketball camp, believe it or not, in 1978. We were both college sophomores. And John was a head coach three years before me. And he gave me great advice that I always pass on to young coaches and especially first-time head coaches. Don't try to be great at everything. Pick two or three things that are really important to you as a coach. And you're going to work on everything. You're going to work on your inbounds plays and your special situations. And you're changing, you know, maybe you're a man coach, but you want to have a change up defense. But what I learned at a young age is don't try to be great at a lot of things. So what was important to me as a young head coach, and I I, I still try to give this advice, is to me it was being sound defensively, and we were pretty much just man-to-man, Chris, probably 95% of the defense that I coached was man-to-man defense. I was the set play, half-court execution guy. And the third thing that I really wanted to be good at was I was a secondary break guy. I wanted our secondary break. Now, we wanted to run and get easy baskets in our fast break, But I wanted our secondary break to be our half-court offense run from the full court. And so those three things, our half-court defense, our set play execution, and our secondary break execution, those were the things we really focused on early in the season because I felt those were the things 
that were important to me for us to get good at so that we could be successful. And every coach is different here. But the worst thing I think a young coach could do is try to have a, be a great zone defense coach, a great man coach, a great press coach. If you're going to be a set play coach, your motion better be very simple. If you're going to be a motion coach or a blocker mover coach, your sets better be simple. So I was really smart enough at a young age to realize we weren't going to be great at a lot of things, but we were going to be great at the two or three things that I wanted to be great at. And that was where we really put our focus and execution. Love it. And you stimulated my thinking as you're talking, because this struck me a little bit is that, that you coached a little bit before analytics became the rage. Yes. How, how much would you change now <laughs> based on your, your obvious depth of knowledge of analytics? Well, we were doing analytics back when I was coaching. We just didn't know it. Of course. Of course. And, <laughs> I mean, and that, sorry. And yeah. just to, just to say that I say that a lot about my stuff too, like in terms of yeah. learning and teaching theory, there's a lot of coaches that are doing things based on evidence, but they don't know the evidence. That's right. That's so right. I get That's what right. you're saying completely. Well, here's what we did. I mean, first of all, I, I'm proud of the fact, and I think Ken Pomeroy would back me up on this. I, you know, I brought Ken Palm to ESPN. By accident, I discovered Ken Pomeroy's stuff back in the, you know, 2005, 2006, figured out how it would work on TV, and it was sensational. And now you hear, you know, college uh, you know, basketball commentators talk about Offense, offensive rebound rate, turnover rate, things of that nature. But I'll tell you what, what I did when I was, you know, again, I, I laugh when you said analytics because we were doing it and not knowing we were doing it. We charted what we called, uh, I called them win stats back then, okay? This is 25 years ago. We charted deflections. We charted contested shots. I don't know who did this before me, but – I loved it when we charted what we call Jasper assists. Now, I was coaching in Manhattan, the Manhattan Jaspers. So when we would watch the film, we would give a Jasper assist to a player whose pass led to either a great shot or a two-shot foul. And it was a great stat for kids who came off the bench. Because, and also, really, it was a great stat. I, one of the reasons I did win stats, it, it was because it rewarded the kids who came off the bench who didn't have great game stats, but we could still show them on film that they made a huge contribution. So when my backup point guard played 12 minutes a game and he only had two assists in the stat sheet, we were able to show him that he actually created six Jasper assists, six shot, six passes that led to either a great shot or a two shot foul. You and I both know when a guy gets fouled two shots, the, the player who passed it doesn't get an assist. So we were able to keep what we call these win stats. Another one I loved was offensive rebounds attempted. We were fanatical about rebounding. So if you and I went to the glass as teammates and you jumped a little higher than me and got the offensive rebound, we still got credit for an offensive rebound attempted each. And we had goals. We wanted 75 offensive rebounds attempted per game for our team. And we kept these win stats. And they were the precursor to analytics in my mind. Yeah, very cool. And I know so many coaches of that, that just pre-analytics era did chart stuff. And it's just getting to, it's getting to this next level of, uh, <laughs> of really, again, like artificial intelligence or whatever it's going to be to take it there. And it's fascinating, isn't it, being immersed yeah, it in is. that? and. And are you finding most coaches that you're now visiting at practice is, is analytics a part of the way they phrase and communicate in practice? You know, it's, it's interesting. I find this, and you watch a lot of practice too. The analytics guy on a staff is usually the youngest guy. You know what I mean? Like yep. a lot of coaches now, I would say second generation coaches, okay? These are guys that have been coaching for 20 years. They started as video guys, Okay. And now, and, and, and video guys are still important. You know, my, I have a, one of my, both of my sons, one's a video guy in Orlando with the Magic and the other, Matt is at Villanova with Jay Wright. And that's what they're doing right now. But I find now that like the youngest guy in the staff is the guy that's convincing the other coaches why analytics are important. And yes, to your question, absolutely. I think coaches, especially more experienced coaches, are starting to embrace the whole concept of plus minuses, five-man combinations, 
of uh, the individual analytics, the team analytics, you know, the different things that we see in Ken Palm, the four factors. And there's no question it's had a huge impact because to your point earlier, it allows us to put a number on something that we thought our eyes told us from watching in practice and watching in games and on the film. I love that we can go anywhere. And I think as we prepared this, I kind of said, hey, let's provide a least loose template because it always helps these podcasts. But I also knew with you, we can go absolutely <laughs> anywhere, which is beautiful. It's, it's so yeah. freeing. So do we overrate mental toughness in conditioning, in practices? Not saying that we shouldn't, and you've yeah. already talked about getting them beyond their comfort level. Yes. yes. But do we overrate it in, in that pure toughness sense and then well, obviously condition? I think it gets back to Ron Adams' great line, don't sacrifice execution for intensity. And I see so many practice ruined because the coach wanted something absolutely perfect. And I was a perfectionist. I'll make no bones about it. And there were times where I had to be really over the top in terms of that perfection and that mental toughness, especially early in the year, in establishing that tone. I know culture is overused, but in establishing that culture, I got to tell you, late in the year, you remember the perfection drill I told you about? Yep. And we'd maybe get it down to 640, right? I would tell my manager at the scorer's table, if it was late in the year and things were going well, and we had a 45-minute practice, make sure they make it today. So that guy would be stopping and starting the clock without the players knowing it. So, you know, that's what I mean by flexibility. You've got to know when you can't go over the top. but. I think a best coaches are all over the place on this. I always felt that if I created a practice that was hard enough and demanding enough that we, we, I've ne I never coached a practice where we ran after practice suicides or line drills, whatever you call them. I just felt that we could create a practice that was so challenging that we could tire them out if we needed to, from a conditioning standpoint, without having to do the extra running. And I, we, took a, we took a certain amount of pride in that. I have seen so many practices ruined by a coach who is just too over the top in terms of not knowing what he was looking for, okay? Now, I'm going to say something that's going to hurt some of my coaching friends. Vince Lombardi said this many years ago about the Packer sweep. You have to know what the end result looks like. And so many of my coaching friends, whether it's teaching offense or defense, don't always know what the end result should look like. And so they think that they're watching something that's not, it's either, let's say it's not good and they're taking it out on their team. And Chris, I always feel like if you're not teaching something well enough, it's not always your team's fault if they're not getting it, if that makes sense. And I've totally. seen a lot of practices ruined that way. Totally. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously you got to look in the mirror first with, that, yes. with anything your players aren't getting. So Yeah, this, I, I think so. So this raises another curiosity question, which is, are you seeing coaches change their approach? Like this old school approach of obviously yelling and, and yeah. commanding through fear. Are you seeing changes in that with just, again, the way society is now? Uh, the rise of social media, all these different things. But also, I mean, there's evidence behind the effectiveness of a different method. But are you seeing changes? Yeah. Completely. Absolutely. I think that, and I know I would be different. I mean, I was a, I was a young tyrant. I'd make no bones about it. I have, I have apologized to a couple players I coached because of my behavior. I coached one guy, and he did end up playing 10 years in the NBA. And I saw him at an NBA Summer League about seven or eight years ago, we've become very close now. He's now coaching the NBA. And I said to him, I owe you an apology uh, because I was really tough on you, maybe too tough. And he said, coach, stop. You're the reason I drive a Range Rover. And I got it. I got it. He was telling me that I pushed him past his comfort level. But I also regret some of those things. And I, and I, I try to counsel young coaches about that today. One of the things that really helps, I think, alluded to this earlier, and I know I've heard it said many times by Stan and Jeff Van Gundy, Brendan Malone, who's a great coach, is you got to coach the why. And I always tried to a pulse on that. Like, I could rant and rave, but it was more important for me to explain to you 
why we do this in practice or why this play has to be run this way or why you have to be in this position in terms of our defensive rotation. So I think that I'm noticing more and more. I wish coaches would coach the why more and explain why they do things. Because when we did really tough, hard, over the top, seemingly crazy drills, quote unquote, I want them to know there was a why behind it. And if you do that and you put your arm around them and you care about these guys off the court and you're Tom Izzo and you scream at a guy during an NCAA tournament game and then the parents come out after the game and say, this is exactly why we sent our son to play for Tom Izzo because people don't see the other 95% of Tom Izzo. I think you can still be old school, but you got to have a compassion for them, love them, and you also got to – explain the why to them if without the why they just won't get it because they're in a we're in a new era they think they know it all and this raises the next part of this question and and again there's no way around it tom Izzo or whoever you want to mention in this yeah. this landscape tremendous coach tremendous impact on people players love them all that stuff the more the question is is if you're a young coach coming up should yeah. you be emulating tom Izzo? i mean obviously you should be yourself Yes. But should you consciously be trying to change and coach differently in this era? Well, I think it's a great question because I come from the old school era. You know, I worked for old school coaches who taught me. Danny Nee, Gary Williams was a tough coach, now a Hall of Famer. Rick Barnes certainly has always been a very demanding guy. And I think it's that old analogy of holding a dove. If you hold a dove too tight, you're going to kill it. If you hold it too loose, it's going to fly away. And I really think there's an art form to get, literally an art form to getting young people to do what you ask them to do, to ask them to go beyond their comfort level, to ask them to hold themselves to a high standard and do it in a way that they actually enjoy doing it. And I would tell you, Chris, this, I, I was very fortunate. I went to eight post seasons in nine years as a head coach and, and, uh, I love what I did. I thought I was successful at what I did. I walked away at an early age because I wanted to spend more time with my family. I had some huge wins in my career. Broke a couple of near 60-game win streaks at UConn and Arizona as a opposing coach. The greatest moment of my coaching career, and I still get emotional about this, is I was coaching a Manhattan team that was 19-2. and two. It was late in the season. I was going to give them a day off on Wednesday. We didn't play until Saturday. And so I told my coaching staff, you get ready because I'm going to make something up five minutes in and lose my mind. And I'm going to throw them out. And I don't want them to think that we're satisfied, but I also want them, uh, they need a day off. They need to rest. So five minutes in, I think uh, somebody turns the ball over and I go nuts. I throw them out. I go up to my office. My coaches come in. They're kind of giggling at me and saying, coach, that was a great act. Five minutes later, one of the managers comes up to the office and said, Coach, they're still practicing. I said, what do you mean they're practicing? Oh, no, they didn't leave. They took the practice plan, and they're still practicing. And my assistant coach has said, should we go down there? And I said, no, it's no longer our team. It's their team. They took so much pride in what we did every day in practice that they thought they were letting me down and letting themselves down. And that's the essence of coaching, is to get a team to go so hard with so much caring about the way they uh, approach the game and practice in games that they don't need you there. And that, that was, that is the single biggest thing that ever happened in my nine years as a head coach. Well, that's great because I haven't shared it on a podcast, but one of my real thoughts, cause I'm sure you get asked this a lot. What about consequences? What about, how do you handle consequences for players? Especially again, moving into this modern era where we know punishments is, yeah. is the, really the wrong word. And I've said, listen, I mean, at the end of the day, consequences should be that we don't improve and we don't get a chance to be better so we can win. And how you yeah. connect your team to that is the most important part of this, is that we have to connect them to the fact, hey, listen, if you don't do your job, we don't win and you don't get better. And those are the things that you're alluding to with this story. Yeah, and you know what? Um, the way It gets back to the way you set up practice because so much of, so much of a good practice is about not just the element of is pressure and one of the greatest things about practice is peer pressure is letting your teammates down. And, you know, if you don't have that sense of 
hurt that you've let your teammates down, you're probably not going to have the type of team that's going to reach its full potential. And I, I think sometimes the best thing a coach can do, and, and I know that this has a lot to do with what, you know, what you talk about with the things you set up in practice with decision-making is, you know, there comes a time in the game where I just can't be out there with you setting up a drill. You know, it's got to be you and the guys that you've been practicing with all year and been in these hard practices and being in these, you know, overload situations mentally and physically. And then, I mean, the most fun, you know, you've coached teams where have you ever had the out of body experience? And I know you have, it's a rhetorical question, where you're not even coaching the game, but they're doing everything that you practiced. And they're making shots and they're moving the ball and they're making the extra pass and they're helping each other on defense. And it's like, I can't believe this is my team. Like, I'm not even calling any plays. They're just playing and reacting. And to me, that's the, that's the essence of getting, you know, 12 kids being able to do what you've worked on all preseason and all offseason. It's 100% that, Coach. I mean, the part that – like, if the thing that you asked me, the thing – I probably can't explain it to anyone other than you. But the thing that <laughs> excited me the most about coaching was those moments where you're sitting there watching and you're going, that's what we worked on. Like, yes. those moments give me chills. Like, yeah. that's what we worked on. Like, that's happening in the game. And that's why I say to coaches all the time, it's got to transfer to the game. If it's just a drill for a drill's sake and it doesn't transfer anything to the game, then you're not going to have that that's what we worked on moment. Yeah, and, and when I do a game now from across the court and I'm watching a coach and I see his team playing well, especially if I've watched them practice, I can put myself in his shoes, as we all can who've coached and, you know, had that moment where everything goes right, even if it's being a part of winning a championship or winning a key game. And I'm looking across as a, from a broadcaster, and I get a little jealous. I do. I get a little envious, not of the coach's success, but of that feeling that you have when it's like being a proud parent. Like, this is what we train these guys to do. And um, that's why when you hear coaches, what do ex-coaches always say? I miss the practices. I don't miss the games. <laughs> Me I felt neither. Like I, was, I was going that 30 minutes before a game, especially if you're at a Catholic oh. school and the priest is in there with you, you feel like you're going to the electric chair, you know, but the practices is, is, is what we all miss. I think when you, when, uh, when we step away from the game. Totally. Totally. Every game was a gut wrenching experience. <laughs> <laughs> I hated the games. And by the way, you know, I don't know how you felt. I slept like a baby the night before games. Because yeah. I, felt, I felt like we did everything we could to get these guys ready. Win or lose, I could never sleep after a game because I, I, I equate it to like piloting a 747. You've made so many decisions over the course of two hours that I don't care how many beers you have after a game or a glass of wine, but I would get home after a 30-point win or a two-point loss, and I still replayed the game in my head for the next two hours. But I could sleep like a baby the night before because I was comfortable that we did what we had to do to prepare the team to play. Uh, you're explaining this, uh, what so many coaches go through. And I think we should, <laughs> I think we should share that with every other person that doesn't understand coaching. Cause yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, Cause, that's it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So yeah, I love that we're connecting a few things here to coach. And you said, uh, oh, let's go back to what we talked about, about looking in the mirror, looking at yourself. And that comes back to this, this idea of consequences and physical punishment. And it just struck me as you were talking that what I'm saying is basically, look, if we have to give our players physical consequences all the time yeah. to do what we want them to do, then we're not connecting the reason why they should be doing it in the first place to help themselves and to help our team. Well, I would say you've got the wrong type. You got the wrong group of guys. I think one of the key things is, and, and of course, at the high school level, you can't really always pick and choose the guys that you want to coach like you can at the college or pro level. But I absolutely think that you have to lay out for a young man when he comes in your program, look, this is how we do things. This, this is what this is. You know, again, I hate to use, I know cultures overuse. It, it really does fit where it fits. It does fit. But, you know, I think I always explain to a player I'm not going to be fun to play for some days in practice. I want you to know that. You know, like I, I remember I, I was, I love recruiting and I love getting to know families. And I'll never forget one of the, one of the players we recruited, he was like three weeks into practice. And he said to one of the assistants one day, whatever happened to the guy that recruited me? Like 
he was such a good guy. And uh, so I think there's some of that, that, hey, look, here's what you've signed up for now. Here's how we do things. And we're, you know, we're unrelenting in our pursuit of excellence. But I also think that the diminishing returns of constantly being the coach who's got the team on edge with the screaming and the yelling, that's, I have talked to my sons and they're completely different at, the, at this age than I was as a, as a young coach. They both, and actually, how about this? One played for Tommy Amaker, the other played for Lon Kruger, two of the greatest guys in college coaching. Neither guy, Lon Kruger, I don't think has ever said a, I know my son never heard a swear word at Oklahoma in four years. Now, Tommy's a little different <laughs> but uh, at Harvard, but they both are guys that you would love your sons to play for and be like when they get into coaching. And so I tried from my perch as a former coach and now a broadcaster to say that old way of screaming and yelling is just not the way to learn how to be a coach in this era. Just not. Coach, uh, there's one other thing. I mean, there's so many things, but let's just let's say there's one other thing that I wanted to hit on your notes about practice. And then this concept of a walkthrough, because the way I phrase it to people is that five on five slow learning is yeah. better than five on oh fast learning. And you talk about a walkthrough, like teaching at the beginning of practice, doesn't slow down. Yeah. And I've seen that as a characteristic of a lot of what I would consider really good practice coaches. Can you explain that a little bit more for people? Well, I, yeah, it gets back to it gets back to the theory that once we get started with perfection, once we've stretched, once we've walked through something new or something we want to remind them of, something we may have just watched for ten minutes in the film room, and we walk through it or we go through it three quarters speed, and we stretch. Once we get on the court and start with perfection, if that's a 90-minute practice, we are not stopping. Now, I'll stop and correct, and oftentimes I would stop and correct or say to an assistant, show him what we mean and take him on the side because you and I both coached a guy that had like the, had 75 questions who wanted to take a break, so he would ask you two or three questions in a row. Oh, yeah. And I would always take that guy and say, hey, you know, see Coach Oliver. Coach Oliver, explain that to him. And so the concept of a walkthrough was we wanted to do our teaching before practice and explain anything that was going to be added that day or something that we wanted to clean up or something we wanted to review. And because when we started with practice, it was being, it was like being on a roller coaster for the next 90 minutes. Okay. Look, the roller coaster is not stopping. It may slow down at the bottom, but we're not stopping. Okay. And we're going to be done in 90 minutes. So, we're, so the, the, the concept really was to do a lot of the teaching early. One thing that I did, Chris, that I don't ever – well, Bill Self does this a little bit now, and he does it well. In fact, he does it more than anybody. I used to like to do my pregame walkthrough for the next opponent after practice. We would end practice and go right out on the court, get the chairs out, and say, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to give you 15 minutes of Canisius. All right? And so – we sometimes sandwich the walkthrough around practice. I like to do some walkthrough stuff at the end of practice, especially where it was uh, you know, demanding 60-minute hard, high-paced practice because now I wanted to get back to, hey, let's think a little now. We've just reacted for 60 minutes. Let's think a little now. I want to give you three or four things that, Canisius, that we're going to see from Canisius tomorrow. And let's, let's go through it right now. And I wanted to leave, I wanted them to leave practice kind of thinking ahead a little bit. So we used a walkthrough both at the beginning and at the end of practice. Coach, uh, circling back to where we started, what are some things that you've seen at some practices over the last year that are things that you think that maybe are a little bit different, but that makes sense to you that maybe are things that we should be looking at at looking at doing differently it's not traditional maybe, but are there some things that have been kind of stimulating to you that you've seen that are a little bit different? Yeah, I think there are. There, there, there's, a, there's always things that I see that go, wow, pretty cool. Um, I can remember Texas Tech three seasons ago before anybody knew who Chris Beard was. Um, I was at a, wa- I was at a uh, walkthrough practice day of a game at Kansas, and Chris knew it would be loud in there. Allen Fieldhouse, one of the great places in you know, college basketball to play in. And so I thought it was pretty cool when they ran their offense five on O they ran it 
as if they were starting the game and running it at the basket away from their bench. And they had the guys that were not in the five on O sequence sitting on the bench with them. And so they basically, I always like to use this word in coaching. They choreographed the first five or six sets. They were going to run that night at the basket away from their bench. And then Chris made substitutions. And then he had a 30 second timeout in that five on O period. And it was all kind of, if you would call a mental dress rehearsal. I really like that. And he, he really believes in that kind of stuff is creating a sense of predicting what's going to happen before it happens. And he would say to them, okay, when we run this five on O, you're going to be trapped on this particular pick and roll action. They're going to trap you. And we need three outlets to come to the ball. Has everybody got that? So it's very much in keeping what, what I love about American football coaches, guys like Parcells and Belichick, is that they've created an environment where – and this is true in, in a regular practice too, not just a walkthrough. And, and I really felt that we wanted to create an environment. I love watching an environment where the coach has created an environment that the players feel that their head coach has thought of everything that could happen during that game or during the whole season. And I learned this from Jeff Van Gundy when I was with him for a year back in the late 90s, make as many pressure decisions in the non-pressure time before a game. And that, you know, and get them ready for the pressure by being prepared. Yeah. It's long, a, I, long-winded. Well, no, that's a great example. I'm glad you shared that because again, it's make it seem like you've already been there. Right. Like that type of Absolutely. idea, like in those pressure yep. moments, even if he's got to call, to call time early, it's like, Hey, we've already practiced this. We're, we've already done this. This shouldn't be, you know, this shouldn't be shocking to us in the sense that we've already experienced it. So. And I also think along those lines, Chris, I don't see enough coaches working on special situations and practices on a daily basis. Well, and Jay and Shano it, gave so many great examples oh, of that. So coaches go oh, listen to man. that if you haven't yet. It was tremendous. That, you, you've had so – I'm not just saying this. You've heard me say it earlier. You've had so many great guests on these podcasts, but Jay's was I, – I was riveted by all the – you know, because Jay's an ex-player, as you know quite well, and I can't oh. wait to get the book. But Jay's one of those guys that is a thinking man's coach, as evidenced by that crazy play on the inbounds play that won him him an NBA game. But my point is not enough coaches give their kids the answers to the test before the test is given. And special situations to me is a must from the start of the season to the very last practice. It's a great way late in the year. One of the things I used to do with my team late in the year is we used to scrim. He had the great idea that I'm going to tweet out here soon about you know 90 all was that what he said or 95 all yeah 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 first team to 100 and we're going to play the last two minutes or three minutes yeah great 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 idea one of the things i used to like to do is we would play down eight three to go we would give the team usually the starters hey it's your ball you're down eight with three minutes to go we're not in a we're not in a, a comeback game yet it's still a possession game if we score we're down six with 240. We're good. We're still, we're still in a possession game. And then all of a sudden, they hit a three. Now you're down seven with a minute four. And now you're in your comeback game. You're pressing. You're fouling. And we used to try to, in lieu of just scrimmaging nonchalantly in the second part of the year, we used to try to scrimmage special situations, either down a three to go. where And by the way, when the head coach is the referee, any crazy thing can happen, right? And then the other thing we used to do, Chris, is, all right, you're up A3 to go. And by the way, you point guard, my point guard, Johnny, you fouled out. You go to the second unit. My backup point guard goes to the first unit. And again, creatively creating those situations in practice that are uh, game-like. And I don't see that as much from my coaching brother in the special situation aspect. Well, and that 95-95, first to 100, to me, is a whole practice where we could do that for a whole practice and get something different out of every experience that helps shape our learners to be able to understand not just special situations, but you're working on your regular inbound, you're working on your regular sideline, press break, all these different things. It's just a way to be able to refresh yourself and get ready to And it keeps your kids interested in practice. Well, which is the most important part, to be honest. (laughs) Uh, That's where I start from is athlete satisfaction. uh, You know, we can talk about intensity and execution (laughs) and all these things, but 
there's nothing more fun in the last 30 minutes of practice in, in mid-February when your kids are still into it. And that's a cool thing. Coach, I cannot let you leave without us sharing our passion for international basketball a little bit. And yeah. are there some teams that you've studied over the last year? Because I get asked a lot, I'm sure you do too, like which team should coaches be studying on Synergy a little bit? Are there some yeah. That you oh, God. Up? There's so many great coaches in Europe, as you know. Uh, my good buddy, Ryan Pannone, who's now the new coach of the uh, Erie Bayhawks, who was an assistant coach at, in Jerusalem. They ran great stuff. If you watch David Blatt, tell you who's a tremendous coach is the Italian coach. I mean, you may have even, you've had him on, uh, Coach Trincheri. Oh, uh, he's tremendous. Yeah. He's a tremendous coach, man. He's at Parsons now for coaches that are listening. He, absolutely. He's, a, he's one of the best coaches in, in Europe. And uh, I would just say that if any coach, high school, college, it's hard not to watch any European, you know, EuroLeague game or any, any uh, international FIBA game and not, be impressed with the coaching. I love Coach Georgievich and the job he does every – I know he's going to step down, the Serbian national team coach. My friend Igor Kokoshkov, who got a raw deal in Phoenix last year, is a great coach. He was a Slovenian national coach. There are so many good coaches that I, I've just only named a few, but you and I both know. Um, again, Chris, they're looking at the Mona Lisa. They just have a different perspective on it, and they bring to us in America and in Canada – some incredible ideas. Well, I love that analogy. It's such a good one. <laughs> I think it's something good every now and then, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to actually explain that. I don't have to do this anymore, but I, I now don't have to worry about explaining to my friends who love the NBA and college basketball how good international hoops has become because of the Greek freak and Jokic and Ricky Rubio. It's, it's such a pleasure to watch these guys come to the NBA much like Steve Nash did back in the uh, mid nineties. And it's such a great game now because it's a global game. And I know when you, when you went over to the Jones cup, I was listening to you talk about yep. your experience, you know, traveling around the world. So it's, it's so much fun. The globe has shrunk when it comes to basketball. Uh, there's learning everywhere. And that's what makes it fun for all of us, especially those of us that love geeking and on basketball. <laughs> it's been great. So, coach, I yep. cannot thank you enough. Tremendous. And I know if you're on a broadcast, it's the one I want to listen to. And I don't know, is that a next level of broadcasting that we can just get a coach that geeks out on the broadcast the whole time? Well, uh, you know, I, th I would love that. I've been accused. Of, I, I, I actually think that uh, I find myself making sure. I, here's how I explain a broadcast. I want my mom in Brooklyn who thinks she doesn't know a basketball from a pumpkin to say, hey, I learned something tonight. So the, uh, the essence of, of, of broadcasting is much like coaching. Explain something that seemingly is complicated in a way that the average fan could say, hey, I get it. So that's what I try to do on a broadcast is not talk over somebody's head, but explain something. Like, by the way, I was coaching a slow learner on my team, right? We each, you and I have both had some guys that, for whatever reason, weren't as quick a learner as the others. And I explained the game in a way that like my, one of my slowest learning guys could pick it up. And I hate to say this, but every now and then, some of my slowest learners were my best players. So if they didn't get it, it didn't matter how good the offense was. It wasn't working. Well, and you do a great job of that. And all I'm asking for is let's get ESPN to do, can we do one college game where it's just you and Hubie Brown, say, doing the broadcast? Oh, how would amazing be, would that be where you guys, yeah. uh, no oh. holds barred, just talk coaching? Well, let me say this. I'm going to give you – now, come on, Chris. Now, you know you love this kid because he's going to score at a high rate in the painted area. Okay, come on. <laughs> now, you love this kid because, you know, every coach in this league, would love this guy because he's going to get you 14 and nine every night. Come on. We all know this. Okay. <laughs> In our league. So that's my UB invitation to end this podcast. Tremendous. Tremendous. Coach, <laughs> your passion comes through every time I hear you talk. Thanks for uh, sharing with all of us. And we look forward to following you this year. Thanks, Chris. And continue this, man. These podcasts are absolutely a huge help. I mean that. Awesome. Thank you, coach. To find out more about coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there 
and share the game.